We're going to start with a case that at first glance seems a little bit bread and butter, and that's a case of shortness of breath. And I distinctly remember this case. It was early fall. I, it was an afternoon shift, like a 3 to 11 shift. I was halfway through it. And the nurses came and grabbed me, and they're like, hey, we're putting a lady in room one, which is one of our resuscitation rooms. They're like, she's a brittle asthmatic. We're a little bit worried about her. She's coming in. She's short of breath. She just seems really uncomfortable. She's working kind of hard. But her lungs are, are clear, and she's satting okay. So it's, just, it's a little bit weird, but we didn't want her waiting out in the waiting room, and so we want you to go see her. I was like, great. So I get up. I start to go see her. And as the nurses are walking away, they're like, oh, yeah, she's also a bit of a handful. I'm like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, she's been kicking up a bit of a fuss out there. She said the waiting room smells really bad. She said our perfume's too strong. It's making her breathing worse. You know, she's, she's a bit much. So I was like, ah, so that's probably the real reason why you wanted me to see her quickly, but that's fine. So I did what any good emergency attending would do. And so I sent my intern in to see her. <laughs> and so I sent this poor intern in and she was in there for about 20 minutes or so. And then she came out and she looked pretty beat. <laughs> I'm like, so what's going on? Obviously, she's not in that much distress or you would have come and gotten me sooner. And she's like, yeah, this woman's weird. Something's up with her. She's a bad asthmatic. She's 49 years old. She's had a history of multiple intubations in the past. She's had multiple ICU stays. So all the sort of scary buzzwords, you know, that we're used to hearing about. Um, she had just been admitted a couple of months ago for a bad asthmatic attack, um, had been on steroids recently, and she's coming in with shortness of breath. And the intern was like, but something isn't, isn't quite right. She said, it doesn't feel like her asthma. She was eating Chinese food last night and then she started getting short of breath. So the patient was wondering whether she's having an allergic reaction. And so I asked the intern, I'm like, well, what do you think? Do you think she's having an allergic reaction? And she's like, I don't know. She's short of breath, but she's not really having anything else. She's not wheezing. She's, uh, not having any tongue swelling, any rash, any nausea, any vomiting, like any other allergic type symptoms. She's just having the shortness of breath and a cough and a little bit of chest pain. So I'm like, all right, let me go see her. And so I walk in and she was sitting up in bed and she did. She looked a little uncomfortable. Um, she was tachypnic. She was working a little bit hard, but she was not wheezing at all. Her lungs were actually pretty clear. And, you know, her vital signs she was, you know, satting 98 to hundred percent. She really wasn't a hypoxic at all. She really, you know, from a vital sign standpoint, looked pretty good, but she looked uncomfortable. So I started talking to her and I'm like, so what happened yesterday? And she's like, I was eating Chinese food and I started choking. I was eating fried rice and I started choking on the rice. And right after that, I started having this shortness of breath and I feel like I can't get a deep breath in. My chest feels a little bit funny. She's like, I think I'm having an allergic reaction. And I asked her, I'm like, have you ever had any sort of allergic reaction before? And she had a bunch of food allergies, but she's like, nothing in there was anything I have ever been allergic to before. She's like, all I know is it doesn't feel like my asthma. And I was like, okay, I respect that. You know your disease pretty well. So I'm like, well, let's do a few things. Let's get a little bit of blood work. Um, we're definitely going to get a chest x-ray on you. Let's try a breathing treatment, see if it helps at all, even though I wasn't that hopeful given that she had no wheezing whatsoever and she had pretty good air movement. But I'm like, let's try it and see. So we ordered all those things and they sent her over for chest x-ray and things got a little bit busy. And so, you know, I checked in with the intern probably about half an hour, 45 minutes later. I'm like, hey, what did her x-ray show? And this was it. And the intern, you know, told me, well, radiology told me that she, they're concerned for like, you know, bilateral airspace opacities, you know, maybe pneumonia, maybe atelectasis. And I was like, well, did you look at the films? And she's like, no, I didn't get a chance to yet. So I'm like, well, let's pull them up. And so we look at them and right away, the reading that we got doesn't jibe. So I'm looking at her bases and they actually look pretty clear. Um, you know, the costophrenic angles look pretty clear. They're a little bit more opaque than the upper lung zones, but that's due to her breast tissue. She's a pretty large lady and there's a lot of overlying soft tissue. So her lungs themselves actually look pretty clear in the, in the bases. What I didn't like though was up in here. And you see the sort of opaque line coming in here and a little bit airspace opacity in here. That's not normal. And you also see it reflected on the lateral as well. You see this very nice straight line here and then some much more sort of consolidated lung up in here. And so anatomically, what we're looking at is this is the right middle lobe and this is the upper lobe here. And what this is then is the minor fissure. 
The other name for this is the horizontal fissure. So that fissure should really be oriented this way, but instead it's sort of deviated up. And so when I see something like that, what it's telling me is that there's volume loss in the right upper lobe. So here's the helpful radiology interpretation. So bibasal or airspace opacities, differential includes atelectasis, infectious or inflammatory etiology. So the intern was like, yeah, I was going to start on antibiotics. I'm like, well, you know, this doesn't fit with anything infectious. She has no fever. It came on very abruptly after eating. Like none of this makes any sort of sense. And furthermore, I think her bases look clear. So again, when I see this finding like this, when I see this minor fissure that's deviated upwards, that's telling me there's volume loss in here. And when you see volume loss like that, it's due to atelectasis, likely due to something obstructing that portion of the lung. And so this is right upper lobe collapse. So then the question is, why did this woman have right upper lobe collapse all of a sudden after eating Chinese food and choking on it? So then you start to worry, is there something obstructing there? And again, you see here's that minor fissure, which is deviated up. Here's this consolidated lung. So the question is, what's sitting more proximal to that that's leading to this right upper lobe collapse? And so we obtained a CT of the chest. You can do this non-con. Uh, to get a good look at the bronchi and the lung parenchyma itself. And so here you see the right main stem bronchus, and right sitting in it is the soft tissue density right here. So the differential for that is, could this be a soft tissue mass, like a lung cancer or something? Possible. But again, the, the onset of this was a little bit more acute than you would expect to see with an obstructing mass. The typical story for that is someone who keeps getting this recurring pneumonia in the same location, um, tends to be more of an indolent presentation. This was very acute. So this makes me worry, is there something sitting, an airway form body sitting in that bronchus? And so, you know, we looked at the lung windows and here you can see, here's that upper lobe that's just totally collapsed down. And so we talked to pulmonology. This was getting into the evening hours. And I'm like, look, I think she has something sitting in her airway. She's stable. I don't think you need to rush in here tonight. But our, the plan that we came up with was we were going to admit her to a monitor bed. They were going to keep a close eye on her overnight with the plan to bronch her in the morning or sooner if she started to deteriorate um, during the night. And in fact, uh, she did well overnight. Uh, pulmonology saw her and they bronched her in the morning. And sure enough, it showed this nice little pea sitting in one of her right upper bronchi, um, which exactly corresponds to that soft tissue density that we're seeing on her CT. So they were able to pull this out pretty easily. They lavaged her a little bit, watched her. Her breathing got much better. She felt, you know, 110% better, and we sent her home. And so I like this case because it brings up a couple of key concepts. And the first is you got to look at your own films. Trust no one. And I drill this into my residents and students. I'm sure they're sick of hearing it from me, but I say it all the time. You have to look at your own films. And this is not to knock the radiologist. I have a lot of respect for radiologists. They have a very, very difficult job. They're reading very high numbers in a black box. They don't have a clinical correlation to go along with them. They don't have the patient to go along with it. And so they're going to miss stuff. And I will tell you that almost every shift that I work, I pick up something that radiology misses. And they're usually not benign things, honestly. Like a lot of these, you know, have dramatic impacts on patient care. So you got to look at your own films. We really owe it to our patients to do that. The other key point is you should have a good sort of basic grasp of anatomy. And so this is what I was talking about. So here's our upper lobe. Here's our middle lobe. And here's that minor or horizontal fissure in between them. In our case, that fissure was oriented much more obliquely like this because of this right upper lobe collapse. And so having that general sense of anatomy tells me when I see something like that, that something is not going, that something is wrong, that something is not right that's going on here. And so having that general sense of anatomy can be really, really helpful in this case. And so you know, here again, just to reiterate that point, here is that obliquely oriented fissure because the right upper lobe is collapsed. So airway foreign bodies um, can be very difficult to see on plain film, even including some of those that are made out of metal, such as aluminum. You would think it would make sort of common sense that metal should show up well on a plain film, but the reality of it is thin aluminum doesn't necessarily. 
And so when someone comes in and you're concerned about an airway foreign body, sort of the go-to is to start with an x-ray, but you have to understand that a lot of them are not going to show up, particularly things like vegetable matter, food, etc. Plastic does not show up well on plain film, so little kids' toys. All these things, you know, you can have a fairly unremarkable looking plain film and still have a pretty substantial airway foreign body. So there are some other types of views that we can get. And so in an adult or an older child who can cooperate, you can get expiratory views as well. And the rationale behind expiratory views is when you take a film in full exhalation, if there's an airway foreign body that's trapping air from getting out, the affected lung won't decompress like you would expect it to. Um, the problem is it's not a hundred percent specific and you have to have a patient who can reliably do that. And so typically in little kids, they're not going to be able to give you an expiratory film. So as a workaround to that, you can obtain bilateral decubitus films where you lay the child down on one side, shoot a chest X-ray and then flip them over and shoot them with the other side down. And you compare the two and what you expect with with a normal decubitus film is that the side that's down is going to decompress due to the weight of the child. If there's an airway foreign body that's causing obstruction, that side won't deflate like you would expect. When they've looked at these in the literature, the problem is they're not great. Um, they don't have great sensitivity nor specificity, and they can lead to a lot of both false positive and false negative bronchoscopies. So they're not great. Really what has started to supplant them is low-dose CT of the chest, even in kids. And a lot of children's hospitals have ado adopted these ultra-low-dose CTs of the chest. You don't need contrast. And really the radiation exposure is minimally more than that of a regular chest X-ray series. So in terms of radiation concerns, it's really not that much radiation, but it just gives you much more detail um, in terms of the airways and the lungs themselves. And, you know, the sensitivity in specificity approach 100% and 98% respectively. So these can be really, really helpful and can really decrease the need for bronchoscopy in a lot of these children. So this is where we're sort of headed. If you have, if all you have are decubitus films, then obviously get them. Sometimes you get lucky, but I wouldn't hang my hat on those. Overall, really interesting case, really brought up a lot of key teaching points. You gotta look at your own films um, and really have, you know, respect the anatomy. So with that, I'm going to leave you. Thank you guys so much for joining me today, and I look forward to uh, bringing more cases to you in the future.